So what I'm going to talk about today is, well, first of all, I want to say thank you for inviting me and for that beautiful introduction. And thank you all for coming and, and being here for part of this. But what I wanted to talk to you guys about today was a little bit um, about not just kind of the journey. You're going to see lots of images of my work, and I'm going to talk about my work, but a little bit about the journey um, that I've taken basically through things like gardening and farming, digging clay, making pots into a cohesive body of work. Um, but also, I started out this talk and made it just a little bit different by including a little bit about the research that is kind of the foundation for most of my creative projects. And so to do that, I'm basically going to start with a quick little five to 10 minute introduction about the American food history. Um, so this is something that I'm really super interested in. And so really, when you think about it, food is one of the most intimate choices that we actually make in our daily lives. We don't hunt and gather anymore, so this is something that we've moved beyond. Um, our contemporary food choices really now have more to do with things like personal preference, um, culture, or things along that more than they have to do with kind of our biological need for nourishment. And so over the past number of, you know, 100 years or so, technology has increased and in, in advanced in so much that food engineering um, has pretty much, um, farming and food engineering has dramatically increased how much we're actually able to produce. Um, and this increase really has had an effect on our food culture in a way that allows us to eat more casually than we ever have before. And so along with this increase came an increased ease of transportation. Um, new growing and irrigation is something that has really affected how we, uh, our American diet. And basically the effect that it has had is to blur those season, like the boundaries of kind of time and season when it comes to food. And so really in just a small window of time, fruits and vegetables that probably we would have only gotten in one season or another um, were now being farmed or now being farmed in other locations that have a more favorable climate and then are being packaged and pretty heavily shipped across countries. So this is, this is not something that is new to us in our culture, but it really does mean, I, I like to note that it's something that is unprecedented. So this is still really new in our history. And so as the population grew, and the, American, the, the pace of American culture started to increase, um, so did our demand for very fast, very easy, very accessible food. So here we get into the fun 1950s advertisements. Um, and so really in the 50s onwards, this push towards convenience started to even further erode our cultural awareness about what we ate. Um, and so really at this moment, our food system and our perception of our food system started to pretty dramatically change. Um, and this is one of my favorites. So while the food industry is getting even more adept at the science of farming and engineering, they're also getting really quite good at marketing. And so, yes, wholesome Coca-Cola. It's great refreshment, wholesome refreshment. Um, okay, so in the past century, the, you know, food has become more than something that is just about nourishment for us. It's become a really big business, so, um, and a really profitable business at that. And so by enticing us with things like low prices, overwhelming variety, big brands have pretty much quickly transformed and taken over our food system. All right, so over the past 10, 15 years or so, and this is an article that's from 2013 from the New York Times, um, they started to expose, or more people have been starting to expose things like how food, big brand food companies and food engineering um, have used marketing foods that are, use, have used marketing to promote foods that have purposefully addictive qualities. So things like sugars, sweets, that kind of stuff has been happening. Um, and it's not only troubling because of the health of our bodies, related to health of our bodies, um, and then it's also starting to be troubling because we start to lose our understanding of basically what's going into our bodies, but then also what's happening in, our, in the creation of these things. And so it goes beyond just our bodies and into the health of the planet. And so I don't know if you guys have ever seen an image of a, of a feedlot before, but these are all cows. Um, and so they have pretty detrimental uh, feature on our, 
on our Earth's surface as well. Um, and so this just kind of leads to the fact that the culture of industrialized production is overproduction, and really we just can't eat it all. And so not only are we overproducing and we're basically adding these things into the ground so we can overproduce and taking all these methods to overproduce, but then we're actually throwing it away in the end. So it's really just a terrible circle to be in. And so in a period, in a period that is kind of the, the blink, uh, the equivalent of a blink of an evolutionary eye, we've become reliant on this system that is making us sick, it's making our planet sick, um, it's basically just doing none of us any good. So that's like the bad part. Um, and the better part is that I'm gonna talk a little bit about the cultural shift that started to happen. And as much as I said just a minute ago that we just really started heavily talking about it in the past, I would say 15, 20 years, maybe it's been a little bit more brought to light, but really this hidden cost of convenience has been um, <clears throat> gaining traction um, since the 40s. And so this is actually an image, you guys know what this is, Julia Child's kitchen. And so um, basically by appealing to our taste buds, people like Julia Julia Childs and Alice Waters, who I'll talk about in a minute, aim to start to shape our food culture through um, basically culinary talent. And so really from the 60s, so this is Julia Child in the 60s, um, trying to empower women to try the art of French cooking um, and created her own hybridized style of cooking that encouraged women to basically stray away from the tin can and back into the garden or to their local markets for food. And then followed up by that about 10 years later is Alice Waters, who also began a Hailing to the American palate through um, basically seasonal food is what she promoted. And so she, I don't know if you guys know this, but she started a restaurant in California called Chez Panisse in 1971. And basically her, her whole mission was to, be, to use the seductive qualities of food to transform the way that we eat. And then another part of her mission with that restaurant, even the beginning, you wouldn't know it now because it's super fancy and super expensive, um, but in the beginning it was really about trying to get people eating locally grown delicious food. And so from there, with this restaurant, she really did want to aim. So that's, you know, in the beginning, that's a little bit more recently um, on the right-hand side there. So she wanted to basically promote the fact that she thought that the best tasting, the best food were all coming from local farmers, local chefs, um, ranchers, all of that. And to this day, Distinct Care still goes into the food that they prepare there um, and making it uh, available for just about everyone. And so that leads me into the idea of the slow food movement. Have you guys heard about that before? Okay, so the slow food movement is basically, it's an idea that started in Italy, or it started in Europe, um, and really the home of the slow food movement in the United States is the Bay Area of California. And so their motto is a universal, basically wanting a universal accessibility to good, clean, and fair food. That is their motto. And so this is basically what the slow food movement promotes. Um, and Waters, Alice Waters, really was a key player in bringing this forward into our country in particular. And this happened really pretty heavily in the 1980s. Um, so in stark contrast to the growing industrialized food system, the slow food movement came in and basically um, celebrated the idea of responsibility and care in creating food. And so since the 80s, there have really been lots of different offshoots about this. And in an extended talk, I talk about things like the TEDx Manhattan Conference Conference, uh, yeah, conference. So if you're ever interested in it, they have like all of these talks about sustainability and food that are all still available on YouTube. Um, but it's the it's a TED conference. Um, but yeah, so there's all these offshoots that are happening. And the good news is that all of these things that have been happening have actually had some very quantifiable effects. So while the collaborations between big businesses and what I would say is like the grocery store change that maybe um, buy food, they're not. They're starting to basically reach out to small farmers and stuff like that. The vast majority still is mass produced, but they're starting to do things like that. Um, but perhaps the most distinct change that you can see in our culture is actually right usually in our backyards. So farmers markets, um, in 2010, there was over 6,000 documented farmers markets across the United States. Um, and really the number, that number is a threefold increase from just the past 15 years. And I'm sure there's actually significantly more than that now. 
And then there's another um, call for action, which is something or another, uh, uh, what do you call that, organizational structure called the CSA. Do you guys know what that is? Okay, so it's, if you don't know what it is, it's a community-supported agriculture, and basically it allows you to uh, pay up front for a share of a farm's um, production in advance of them actually growing it, and then you pick up the allotted amount every week. And really what that does, it allows you as the consumer to basically go in and say, I value what you're doing, here's the upfront money for you to buy the seeds, and I'm gonna basically be give a share of money so that I will get that share back in the end. So when you go to pick up the food, you don't pay, you pay in advance and that allows them to plant it and grow it for you. Um, and so, that has had a really pretty standard, or really dramatic, should I say, increase. And so really in about 1986, there was only what I could find, about two CSAs on record. And in 2010, there was over 4,000, and I actually just did a little bit more research into it the other day, and I was looking because that was the last one that I could find was 2010, and then recently I looked at one that said in 2014, it was probably closer to 12,500. So triple that even. It's hard to quantify. That's what I'm getting from the research that I'm doing, but it's huge. It's becoming a lot bigger. So that's good. So we're starting to basically take a little bit more of an active approach to our understanding where our food comes from. All right, so now I'm going to talk about my work. Um, so this is a little bit of the intro about my work as a ceramic artist. But before I do this, I think it's pretty important to tell you a little bit about how I grew up. And so I feel like um, many of us, our childhood has a pretty big influence on what we end up doing as adults. Um, and so I consider myself very, very fortunate to have grown up um, in the outskirts of, uh, in New Jersey, in the outskirts of New York City with a backyard garden. So that's me eating the carrot on my mother's lap um, on a bench in our garden. And that is me with my father helping um, dig up basically what would be known as the kid garden. I'd like to think that I was doing a lot of labor right there, but I wasn't. Um, and so this was actually a really important part of my childhood. And I really do think it was because I grew up right outside of New York City that they found it really important to actually bring us to places like this. And so much um, as though you might not believe it, this is actually in New Jersey. Much in this, yeah, <laughs> yes, it is in fact the Garden State. Um, it's not just the interstate that you drive through. Um, and so there are some still, I mean, maybe they're less and less now, but there are some really distinct places of beauty and some farmland still in New Jersey. And this is actually a place called Grover's Farm where I went as a kid and we, you know, when, when it was seasonal, um, we would pick strawberries and pumpkins and all those sorts of things that they actually grew there. Um, and so I didn't know it at the time, but it was right at this moment where I was really starting, A, I was understanding seasonal food, but then also I was starting my kind of profound love of agriculture. And of course, this went hand in hand with a love of cooking. And so this is also something that I did a lot as a kid. And so it shouldn't be as any, come as any surprise that at 23 years old, um, I took my first pottery class. When I graduated from college, I took my very first pottery class at a community art center with the intent of making a set of nesting mixing bowls. And all of the people who are in here who have taken pottery classes can laugh at that because it's really hard to do. <laughs> and so it took me probably five years to be able to actually do that. But, you know, but I did it in the end. I did make my set. No, maybe it was three years later I made my set. Um, but, so I started out in pottery, and when you start out in pottery classes and learning a new skill, you're looking at a lot of objects, I'm looking at a lot of pottery objects, I'm picking things up, I'm assessing their form, I'm assessing their volume, but really as I started to go beyond just the skill-based stuff, I started realizing, like as I, I was making pots for a living, I started realizing that the images that I was surrounding myself with as inspirational images leaned less towards being pots and more towards being images that I would consider like the quintessential American agricultural landscape. And so things like barns. So at some points in my actual early career of making pots, things like that sloping roof line on the top of the barn, that was kind of directly translated into the lines on my pots. Things like the tops of the barns and the doorways, those kind of got direct, got kind of directly transferred into my work. That kind of textured surface was an illusion of that weathering. 
And so really for a number of years, I ran my own business from 2007, really through the end, well, uh, for almost 10 years. Um, I still have my own business, but obviously I do this a lot more now. Um, and so with that being said, for many, many years, I addressed that kind of love of through, food through the forms of the objects that I created. So things like teapots or berry bowls or cheese dishes or anything like that. Um, anything that would kind of liven the daily experience with eating. Um, but after a little while, something started to shift. And so basically, this is what I call the pottery glamour shots. This is like the equivalent to the, the nicely swept hairdo of pottery world. Um, and so this is the glamour shot. And I kept taking images of my pots like this, and they felt really, really formal. Um, and so in 2010, I started, and this is pre-Instagram, mind you, so I gotta say that now. So this is pre-Instagram. I started taking my first fo um, photos of pots, trying to be playful and to put them in a, maybe an unconventional domestic setting, um, to take them out of that you know, traditional glamour shot. And so these images really were my first attempt to photograph my, wor my work in a way that made it a little bit more personal, brought them into the kitchen, um, and really was trying to kind of make them accessible in a new way. So on a whim, I really started to play around with the idea of photography as a tool for advocacy. Um, and so this quickly spiraled into a desire to create more professional, and I am not a photographer, I just put that out there, um, but to create more professional looking photos um, that really highlighted handmade pots and food together in a way to see if I could get this balance of the, does the pot look better because of the food or does the food look better because of the pot? So they would be mutually supportive of one another. And I just thought that that like, like woven bread and the edge of that plate were just so beautifully connected. Um, and so just taking these photos really got me thinking um, pretty intently about how pots have the ability to frame food. Um, they also have the ability um, to use color to affect how the food is perceived. That's something that happens when we eat that we don't necessarily talk about. Um, and then most importantly, taking these photos in succession helped me realize the fact that I was really highlighting and creating in these photos um, food, I was highlighting food that leaned towards either homemade, locally grown, or in the words of Michael Pollan, real food. Um, and so that's kind of where um, this realization started to push me to question basically not just my interaction with the pots, but then how I could actually use pottery and the language of pots to promote the consumption of a very specific type of food. I had never thought about it that way before. And so this is where my whole Watt body of work really did start to change pretty significantly. Um, and this change was kick-started because I went, I got a fellowship through the National Council on Education and the Ceramic Arts, it's in SICA. Um, I got a $2,000 fellowship to travel to the Bay Area of California to research, which is basically a region that is kind of steeped in culinary history, and this is actually all of the places that I went. Um, but really my intent was to research the overlap between the handmade pottery movement and the local food movement um, in, an, in, a, in an area where the culture truly embraced this. So remember I said this is the home of the slow food movement in this country. And so I wanted to see if in this area there was any overlap happening. And so really I wanted the chance to basically go see gourmet chefs, um, visit pottery studios, but chefs that were touting that they really um, supported locally grown food. Um, but most importantly, I I also wanted to visit things like restaurants, artist studios, farms, farmers markets, um, in an attempt to understand where, if or where that overlap between pots, like local pots and local food was happening. And not to keep you, so I don't keep you in suspense or anything like that, really there was an overlap happening and it was very apparent from the very first day I was there. So this is the dessert that came out on a plate at a place called Bar Tartine. Instantaneously, I recognized that it wasn't an industrial pot, it was a handmade pot, and so I asked the waiter where they got it, and basically in the, on this trip, I was able to basically follow the pot to the person, to the farm, to, um, and then back to the restaurant again. And so I actually went and kind of followed a couple of trails just to learn how these things were happening. And then the following morning, I actually found a pot that I could identify the artist just by knowing the Bay Area artist before going, and so this is a little Ray Dunn plate that came the next morning at our meal. So it was happening. However, 
Most of the places that I went, they weren't necessarily on handmade things, but it was very, very clear that the restaurants that were really invested in supporting their local farmers were really doing some pretty incredible um, things with plating the meals. And so this was a little glass plate um, from a restaurant that sadly closed. It was really the best food I think I've ever had. Um, and so nearly all of them, even if they were industrial pots like this one, they were using serving vessels of the, the food in pretty interesting ways. And a lot of them had this like wide sweeping framework around the food. Um, this one had a little bit of an offset rim that was pretty compelling. Um, and then a lot of them use things like this one actually you can't quite tell from the photo, but it slopes down into a divot on the inside. So it's a pretty interesting um, plate to serve something on. But really, all of them, you know, were using this idea of framing of the food to celebrate the beauty of the food itself. Okay, so this brings me back from my trip. So now I go back to my studio. Um, and so when I returned from my trip, I started to consider a little bit more significantly how I might actually design vessels that would bring that visual beauty of the food or of locally grown food to help encourage um, basically a more sustainable food system. So I wanted to take that cue from Alice Waters where she was trying to appeal to the of the from the seduction of the food itself um, in a way to boost the cultural value of the food. And so really to me, this is actually from the trip in California, this is like one of the most beautiful scenes to me, that, that long range view of food growing on a farm. And so this was the birthplace of what was my MFA thesis show in graduate school, titled Close to Home. Um, and my aim with this show was really to kind of reconnect the audience with the seasonal nature of food. Um, and this is, I'll give you a second to read that quote. It's another really good one. And so it didn't take me long to realize that to do this or to kind of promote this most effectively, I was gonna have to collaborate with a farm. Like that was realization number one when I got back. And so this brought me to this amazing human right here. His name is Noah Shatama. Um, and he was one of the head farmers at Swallowtail Farm in Alachua, Florida. And so Swallowtail is actually a small organic and biodiverse farm, so they interplanted things with one another. It was run by seven people, and really from the moment that I got to this farm, so I, I, from the moment that I went out and visited the farm for the first time, it was very, very apparent that these people were most definitely not farming for a living, they were living to farm. Like they loved, much in the way that artists love what they do, they loved what they do and felt very passionately about it. And so from September through December of 2012, in graduate school, I got up at 6 a.m. on Friday morning, every morning, and went out and spent a full day on the farm. Um, and so my tasks for the farm range from doing things like collecting eggs. They actually have now, now they have a creamery and cows and pigs, but when I was there, they just still had the chickens. Um, laying irrigation hose, that was earlier in the season. Um, planting, some beautiful patterns happen when you're doing the planting and the watering. And then of course to things like harvesting, cleaning things before the Saturday market. And so physically working in the fields allowed me to kind of clearly see those repeated lines, you can see the kale and the broccoli, those repeated lines um, and patterns that go across the landscape of a small farm. Um, but I was also really struck by the desire to convey this idea of simplicity of the space too, um, and the quietness and the repetition and the balance of the space. These were all things that I got just from basically being there and working. Um, and that was somebody that I worked alongside of. So in the exhibition, it was really my intent not only to bring the feel of the farm into the domestic setting, but also to give locally grown food um, a space in the contemporary home that was a featured space, so to basically elevate it. And so to do this, I merged the aesthetic of the farm and the contemporary dining room throughout the space of the show. Um, and each piece that I made was designed to simultaneously represent the way that the plant grew out of the ground, as well as some form of culturally established, usually ceramic or otherwise object. So um, this was my kale vase, and so that's how kale goes out of the ground. That's the kale vase. I also lovingly referred to them as my kale spaceships, because um, when you took the kale out, they kind of look like spaceships. Um, but the kale vase was one that 
I designed, and it was a re uh, reference to a tulipier, which is not a common object anymore, but basically it's a large vase that's designed to present tulips of flowers. We're used to presenting flowers on the table. I turned it on its head and presented kale at the middle of the, as the kind of corner of the show. And then also there were carrot and onion vases and they were designed to reference both rows in the field but also things like candelabra. So I wanted them to feel at home in the space. Um, and then also these, the, the food that I highlighted was actually um, being picked at the time of my show. So way far in advance I decided that carrots, kale, and um, onions and other things were gonna be the things in my show because they were in season at the time. So all in all, the show included 28 hand-built ceramic vessels and 24 glass vessels. I don't know if you can see the carrots and the glass vessels there. Um, they included things like glass pot pedestals that were full of soil that actually kind of visually connected the, the pot or the plant, the idea of the plant to the ground. Um, and then as well as a dining table. So this was like the central focus or the central point um, where plates and bowls kind of surrounded vegetables that were inset in um, glass-covered soil. And so this really was my attempt to give um, the farm or that kind of kaleidoscopic farm landscape um, a visual place of status in the contemporary home. All right, so that brings me out of graduate school and then back to Asheville, North Carolina. And so right after I left Florida, I went back to Asheville, North Carolina. And this is what, where one more final shift that brings me into my current body of work um, started to happen. And what happened when I was there is I found clay in my backyard. So that's something that I have never had before. I was, surprise, surprise, planting a garden and there was a ton of clay in my backyard. Um, and so I just want to talk just briefly about the act of preparing and using clay straight from the ground. It's a pretty significant process. Um, and none of these photos are of me doing it because I don't have any pictures of me doing it. These are all students that I've had do this. Um, and so it really involves a significant amount of labor digging. So that's first, you gotta haul out to the place where you go. You're gonna dig it and you're gonna put it in a bucket and you gotta haul that bucket back to wherever you're taking it. Um, and so there's a lot of hauling involved. And then there's a lot of categorizing involved. So this was from a workshop that I did at Aramont last summer where we dug clay from all over the campus of that, uh, that craft school. And so we had to keep buckets labeled from where we dug it to see if it was actually the same clay or different clay. So there's a lot of categorizing that happens. There's a lot of blunging. Thank goodness we have drills to do this job now. So we basically slake it down and hit it with a drill um, to turn it into a slurry and then you have to sieve it. And so once you've sieved it, you can go through different screening processes to sieve hey, that disappeared. There's, an, there's supposed to be an image there of testing. So basically, you then basically make like little balls or objects, cups, that you can put little tests through a kiln to understand what happens in there. Um, but, so you can see, it's kind of a labor-intensive process, but I think I could make probably the analogy of somebody who is willing to cook steel-cut oats. You know, not everybody's invested in it, but the people who are think it's worth the effort. Same thing with clay. Um, so what you get out of it then is, A, it's a material that's very tethered to your local history, the ground, that kind of stuff, philosophically. But then it also has, I don't know, it's hard to see in this photo, it's hard to capture it, but this ground here is full of mica. And so it's, it's actually, I call it glitter clay. It's totally sparkly when you see it and you shake it. Um, and so it's really a beautiful, heavily textured clay that comes out of the ground. And so this is into my most recent body of work. So I started experimenting with this backyard clay as I moved forward and made new ties to the food movement in this kind of area. Oh, I don't know where these images are going. They're showing up on my, um, on my preview. Um, but basically, over the past five years, um, I've been starting to use food photography more as an advocacy for pots again. So basically, to kind of work with what's happening in the food uh, culture now, as I've gone back to kind of using photography as a tool for advocacy. Um, I've also been a part of these kind of orchestrated dining events. I've done a couple of those where um, this one is an image that came from the Bull and Beggar restaurant in Asheville, North Carolina. 
um, and this was in 2014, and this particular one was called Pairing Elements. Um, and for this one, it was the biggest one that I've done, and it's 13 different artists came together and made 50 object eats that were surrounded or were that under the theme of the major earth elements, so like earth, wind, fire, um, water, that kind of stuff. And so these elements were used as a conceptual tie, not just for the, the objects that people were eating off of, like the plates and the cups, um, but also they were the conceptual tie for the food as well. And so in advance of the event, I was told that flaming pheasant was gonna be on my plates and that I had the one of fire. And so to basically do this, I created work that was made, made to design or uh, the, the abstracted movement of a flame is kind of what I went for. Um, and really I was also thinking back to my time in my trip in the Bay Area of California, thinking about plating um, and giving the person, you know, the chef a, a ample space to plate the food nicely. Other avenues that I've pursued to collaborate with food is to collaborate with food photographers and food stylists. Um, and so these two images are a result of a collaboration that I did with a Brooklyn-based food photographer named Robert Bredvad. Um, so he took those amazing images, and this is an image from that book, Senses and Sucrose. Um, so uh, Roberto Cortez is the person who wrote that book, and it's not a cookbook. It really is just a, exactly the Alice Waters philosophy of the seduction of food. It's all about emotions and how food are tied, and so we, he has a whole spread of several of my black, um, my darker plates on there with the food that he was creating. I can't remember the mood that it was, but it's really beautiful images. And then there are things like I've worked with um, um, the popular food blogger, Julia Sherman, who wrote a cookbook recently, which you saw an image of that one before. And then there's been a couple of magazines, like you had said. So, so those are the ways that I've kind of tried to keep connected to people who are really interested in food and tried to really connect, because I really do think there's a lot of overlap between folks who are interested in food and folks who are interested in um, maybe supporting um, local pots too. And so this brings me to my most recent work. Um, so last year I actually did a show um, that was kind of a, what I would call a sister show or a tie to my, my thesis show. Um, and it was done in collaboration with So True Seeds in Asheville, North Carolina, um, to make a series of work that was really my first attempt at talking about the idea of monoculture um, through a series of vessels um, in a show that was called American Monolith. And so for this exhibit, exhibit, I presented a series of unfired clay pots, so these were never fired, um, that had been embedded in seeds, or with seeds, rather. And so like my thesis show, these were designed to adopt a visual likeness to something kind of like that monolithic image of a barn on a landscape, but also to resemble um, the visual structure of a basket. And then the seeds that were chosen were related to some form of, were all related to a sustainable growing practice. And this was reflected in their titles. Um, and so things like succession planting is something that you can do that's actually beneficial for both the crop and the ground. Um, companion planting, so things where you would plant um, plants in close contact with one another and that they actually feed one another as they grow and they all grow stronger together. That's called companion planting. And then there's things that you can do like planting cover crops that will actually embed the soil with nutrients before you plant a specific crop in it the next. So it's really planting a cover crop is just about basically making the ground better um, for your next time without using fertilizers. Um, and so all of this was really done in an effort to show, like my thesis show, A, the beauty of the seed, because I think they're absolutely gorgeous and they're just this beautiful natural mystery, um, but also to encourage the audience to understand something more about sustainable practices and food cultures. And really these vessels were in my mind a direct challenge to this like monolithic idea of monoculture um, that seems so embedded in our food system now. And so really the aim was to give the audience a visual metaphor that spoke in support of another option for American farming. Um, and so the final part of these is that they were on fire. They're actually on, on exhibit right now at a, a Walter, State Univers or Walter State Community College. Um, and then from there I'm going to plant them and document um, what happens after that. 
And so this brings me into my current studio where I'm asking myself lots of technical questions always about how to better use food and photography as a tool for ceramic advocacy, but then also how I can use the form and surface of a pot to better um, increase, like a pot, make a positive interaction with the food. Um, but really more importantly, I think, is the question of how can food, how can food and the human story of our relationship to pots um, um, add to the human story of our relationship to pots, but then and also how can pots add to the relationship with food. Um, and so in closing, um, when I titled my thesis show Close to Home, it was, of course, intended to reference things like um, the domestic spaces that we live in and then also evoke things like comfort um, that we find within them. But really, on a more theoretical plane, I think our home is way more um, expansive than our, just our domestic spaces. I think our home is things like um, everything that exists when the, within the collective moment that we live in, um, its seasons, its years, its relationships, its strength um, of communities. Um, it's basically the truth that can be found in becoming aware of one another. Um, and so through my work, I really hope to impress in a visual way that there's a pleasure to be found in reconnecting and slowing down and understanding um, the, new, the nature of the world that we're in. Um, and really the reconnection has one core truth um, that I've come to embrace over the years, which is basically a very simple one of quality over quantity. And so this is really the same truth that exists for many people in the handmade pottery and sustainable food movement. And really it's in with this truth that I really suspect that I will continue to build my body of work kind of from here into the future. And that's it, that's what I got. How'd I do? How much time is there? I couldn't even see the time. Oh, not too bad. Good. That was about what I was aiming for. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. <laughs> You know, that's a really good question. Yeah, you know what I did? I actually got a book. <laughs> so there's a really great book that's, I, I can't remember the exact title, but it's like something super normal, like food photography. Um, and so I started looking at that in particular because that's what I was interested in. And of course, being an artist, I have a background training and kind of understanding color, color theory, that kind of stuff, design of space and like separation of objects and that. But I, hadn't, I had no idea how to deal with food photography in particular. And so, yeah, I really went to a book first. And then, I mean, and what was really funny is I did feel like I was kind of getting better at it. And then I did a collaboration with a photographer and I was like, oh, <laughs> I'm not good at this. <laughs> Could you talk just a little bit about the difference of, um, of working with clay that you're digging up in, in your backyard and then, and then other clay? I mean, yeah. I mean, you talked about the process, which just is sure. amazing. But What's the difference in, but in the throwing the pot, but also the end product? Yeah, so absolutely. So basically, I think if you were to take a clay class anywhere, for the most part, you're getting clay that's coming straight out of a bag. And I equate this to the Wonder Bread of clay. So it's like made out of like this, it's like this perfect recipe that this clay company has designed and they've put in all of these ingredients to make it like perfectly usable for hand building, throwing, or sculpture. Usually there's different types of clay, but that's how it works is that we get it in bags because somebody's already put it together for us. But when you take it from the ground, Basically, what you have to be willing to accept is the fact that you get what you get. Um, you can actually add in other ingredients if you have access to them, or you can do what I did for a while, which is basically I took bagged commercial clay and local clay, and I actually just wedged them together into a combo for a while. Um, that worked too. But the difference is, A, it's, it's quite visually different. So when you're doing anything kind of like a, like a Wonder Bread, you know, they're, 
putting in these ingredients that make it both puffy and tasty and salty. And you know, they're getting this, they're going for this like quintessential loaf, right? Same thing with clay bodies, is they want it to be perfectly groggy so that it does exactly the right things for you. And so they become really uniform. And there's very little color variation. There's very little like texture variation. And when you pull clay from the ground, you get what you get. And so you have to be willing to kind of deal with um, the, the positives and negatives of that as you go along. And so um, I think it's, unless you live in the mountains, there's a lot of potters and ceramic artists in the mountains that do a lot of um, local clay digging and glaze material finding from the area because it is so rich and the, the area is so rich in clay. Um, but I think in other areas of the country, it's not quite as common. And so I feel like we're very lucky. There's a number of people here who are actually doing this kind of wild clay research, um, which I think is pretty great. I probably could, yeah. I probably could if it is literally straight out. Like if they've blended it and made it really uniform and stuff like that, maybe it would be a little bit more disguised. But yeah, you can. And actually, there's a really super awesome company um, called Starworks Ceramics now that just opened in Star, North Carolina like four years ago. And their whole mission is to basically um, provide the, the, the convenience of a commercial clay, but using only local materials. And so very small scale mining, small scale kind of production for it. They're not very big, but their clay bodies do kind of function um, similarly to commercial ones, but they do also sometimes work in commercial materials. So that's probably why. But the wild ones, the ones that are 90% wild clay from them, you can absolutely see. Um, a difference. It's got a really distinct texture. The clay around here tends to be very um, um, red and uh, it almost looks like, you know, when you step on sand that's wet um, and then you pull the sand with your hand, it like makes this kind of choppy mark. You can see that in the bottoms of the pots. The clay here can be kind of sandy and micaceous. And so it does, it looks quite different. It doesn't look smooth and uniform. Yeah, yeah in a way that I think is really pretty, but can also wreak havoc on your process. So <laughs> it can make you want to pull your hair out. <laughs> but it's beautiful, and it's worth it, I think. Yeah, that's a really great question. And so I think it's a little tricky because obviously, yeah, this has got a mind of its own. Um, I think uh, it's tricky because restaurants are businesses in themselves and they have to think about their bottom line and then they also have to think about functionality. And so industrial made plates, they are definitely designed to be high fire, a little bit usually more chip resistant. I use the example of the, dine, the good old diner mug. You guys know a diner mug. Holy moly, those are the worst things to drink out of ever because they're like an inch thick and it's like drinking off of your pinky. You know, so they're thinking about things that are have to do with more with like a business, like bottom line and then functionality. Handmade pots don't usually fit into that. They maybe aren't that nicely stackable. Um, and there's other things that go into that that make them a little bit more problematic. So what I've seen happening is things like that I did where there's small scale events where it's aimed to highlight um, the joy of basically having a meal that has been um, eaten off of handmade things or maybe carefully, carefully curated with handmade objects. Um, and so I do feel like they tend to happen more in instances, specific instances, but places like Curate in Asheville, even downtown Dos Gatos here. There's a number of places that have basically hired potters, like the place Bar Tartine that I went, um, to make what I would consider some more uniform tableware that is used in like the daily functioning of their restaurants. And I do think that that helps um, raise awareness. Um, but in the case of the dinnerware events that I did, really, um, it kind of taps into the idea of curating the space and the experience in the same way that maybe an artist would curate a space of a gallery 
or you know, it doesn't the the experience doesn't stop just at the tablecloth. You know, restaurants will basically design a whole atmosphere, but then all of a sudden the the design decisions stop at the tablecloth, and then it's a white plate. You know, and so it really was about um, those events are about curating an experience, um, which you know is kind of problematic in some ways because I think it's exclusive, kind of like the Chez Panisse. Once the restaurant, once the prices go up, mm -hmm. um, and so there's a there's a group of um, artists not now called the help me out here ceramics folks the social craft collective is what it's called um, and it's basically a lot of ceramic artists that are doing activism on a smaller scale that has to do with not just food but other types of activism um, but a lot of them are doing like small scale dinner events that are able for more people to basically repeat um, and come to things that would have them experience something like that event um, not on a large kind of expensive scale so people are doing this kind of advocacy see in all sorts of ways, which is pretty awesome. Yeah? My question was totally related to that. OK. <laughs> yeah. I was wondering about how uh, these like, events at your gallery events or sort of your partnership um, elemental yeah. dinner things match up with your activity. And if you have things, like if you have CSA, CSA representatives come to your events uh -huh. as a way to encourage people or give them an opportunity to yeah, that would be the next step, right? So I haven't done it yet, but I feel like that would be another step that could be something to talk about moving forward. And actually, you know, I think the restaurants definitely use the ongoing shift, cultural shift towards wanting to know where food is coming from. They definitely like advertise that in their promotional materials and usually on the menus, but really to have a representative there, like we were there, I think that would be great. I haven't done it, but it would be awesome. <laughs> you know, but every time that I've done something like the, the So True Seeds and stuff like that, there's always been an element that was a promotional element that I would let people take home with them, like a card or a seed packet or a button, like with my show, I did a little post, my thesis show, I did a posted uh, postcard that had the farmer's market times on it, um, and then a button or a magnet that you could put on your refrigerator to help remind you to go. Um, so there's always some form of like little object that's like an outreach type object um, that should hopefully maybe go beyond the gallery setting. Yeah. Anything else? Well, awesome. Thanks, guys. Yeah. <laughs>